Hello and welcome to the Media Podcast. I'm Matt Deegan. On the show this week, the BBC have a new chair and a new licence fee settlement. Our panel discuss what it all means. Also on the programme, how did they make Planet Earth 3? The creative director of the Beeb's Natural History Unit takes on a Wildlife 101. Uh, all that plus Spotify making big cuts, the Premier League bounces back, and in the media quiz, we discover who's been foiled by Fleet Street. Uh, that's all coming up in this edition. In the news this week, BT have announced a partnership with Apple TV to produce an EE TV app with live streaming and on-demand content, a custom EE branded remote, including TV guide button, and automatic setup for the Apple TV box. It's the first deal of its kind in the UK. Uh, Claudia Winkleman is leaving her Radio 2 show. The broadcaster's departure is one of many changes to the station this year. Uh, Romish Ranganathan will join in April saying, I'm grateful to Claude for wanting to spend more time with her kids and enabling me to spend less time with mine. And Carol Vorderman has snubbed an offer from GB News. A well-placed source told The Mirror that Carol wouldn't touch GB News with a barge pop. Now, joining me at the London Podcast Studio is we welcome back Adam Bowie. Hello, Adam. Hey, Matt. Good to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, you like stats. What is your favourite stat of this week? 4% and we'll come to it later on. Oh, good tease. Good tease. And uh, I was doing a thing today that I think you were watching. Uh, was, tell everyone about it. Yeah, it's called Sounds Amazing. And it's a, a one day sort of now virtual event that the BBC put on each year. It's all about sound as the, the name gives away and uh, I think it'll all be online at some point but yeah it's uh, lots of people talking about different elements of sound you were talking about AI and sound but we had people from the film and TV world talking about sound so uh, an amazing guy who does this, did the sound for Paddington and has done it for Wonka coming out I believe this week and an amazing woman as well who Uh, did the sound on things like SAS Rogue Heroes, a Stephen Knight drama from BBC, and working in 50 degree heat, talking about working in 50 degree heat where none of the the recorders are made to work at those kind of temperatures. And also if you get sand in them, they'll just break. So really good. And yeah, if you're interested in sound, it's worth checking out. Keep an eye on that, I think, from the BBC Academy. Uh, And then next to Adam, we have Broadcast Magazine's Rebecca Cooney. Hello. Hello. Uh, And you've been talking to all the people from Bad Wolf, the Doc 2 production company. I have indeed, yes. Uh, Ahead of the kind of the release of the specials, I spoke to uh, Jane Tranter and Julie Gardner and Russell T Davies. And uh, I mean, I'm a massive Doctor Who fan, (laughs) so like technically it was work. (laughs) Technically it was work. But um, no, I did get to geek out quite a lot. And they just seem incredibly excited to sort of be back at the helm of it because obviously Julie Gardner, Jane Tranter, Rusty Davis were kind of the team that bought it back in 2005. They sort of did the main reboot, didn't they? Yes, yeah. So Jane Gardner kind of commissioned it. Uh, Julie Tranter was the head of drama at BBC Wales, I believe, at the time. And then they've gone off and made their own company and now they're kind of, yeah, they've sort of taken over it with this deal with Disney. Yeah, imbued with Disney cash. Yes, very much. It's very visible on screen, isn't it? It's just, um, so like in the latest episode, there's this kind of great big long spaceship and they need to get along it. And kind of this little vehicle appears and I think in the old days it would have been a golf cart but now it floats and you can see it floating Um, so yeah you can see where the money's gone into these special effects Adam you've got to spend the cash on these things now haven't you You do audiences just expect it you know we live in a world where you've got Game of Thrones you've got the kind of science fiction that Apple do which all look incredible and audiences and obviously Marvel and audiences just you know don't expect just because it's one broadcast or another that things should look different so it's brilliant that they've got that cash um, well, uh, the people spending that money often are the BBC, and there's always news. There's always BBC news here on the Media Podcast, because there's a new BBC chair, and it's Samir Shah. What do we know about Samir? So, Samir is uh, very much a TV man. So, he has run for many years a production company called Juniper, which um, they've made kind of shows for a range of channels over a range of years. I think kind of, sort of probably one of the most recent ones was uh, This Week, which was the sort of long-running Andrew Neil show. Mm. So, yeah, he is from a television background, which I think is going to be really interesting, just because kind of you know these people you know chairs of BBC it tends to be kind of you know somebody from the treasury or sort of a money person or a kind of public policy person so to have somebody with a TV background at a time when we've got a real kind of um, sort of commissioning slowdown within the TV industry and the TV industry is in real panic I think is going to be like I think really helpful and there's going to be just a, a sort of a different level of insight going on there I mean Adam normally it's a political appointee well this is still a political appointee but they don't always have a great connection uh, to broadcasting no they might have come from banking in the past, for example. I think I, th- I think that will be welcomed. Um, obviously, yeah. So, what, you, what has media been sort of saying about it? Um, I think it's been pretty positive. I mean, you've certainly seen people like Andrew Neil, obviously, who 
who <laughs> knows him. Um, mm. and, uh, but, you know, a number of people because he's, you know, he has worked at LWT before. He did a stint for, I think, the BBC Politics Unit down at Millbank in the past. So I think it's got to be formalised. So we've mm. got, an, there's an acting chair at the moment um, and it will happen at some point in the new year, I guess. Hey, Rebecca, a more pressing for the broadcaster is Thursday's licence fee settlement, uh, which has popped a tenner on, I think, yes. up about 6% uh, to £169.50, so still below inflation. Um, BBC don't seem entirely happy with that, do they? Not overjoyed, no. Um, so basically a couple of years ago, the government said we're going to freeze the licence fee for a couple of years and then we'll raise it in line with inflation. So in line with inflation, as it was, as they were measuring, it would have been, as you said, about 9% and that would have added about 15 quid onto yes. it. Um, they kind of sort of started making noises like, no, oh, no, we're not going to do that. They've then come back and said, we are going to raise it in line with inflation, but the, it seems to be the way they're measuring inflation, uh, they're calling it 6.7%, I believe. Um, so, <laughs> So, yes, it's which month you pick. Yes, bit, yeah, it's it? when mm. you decide when the inflation comes from. Um, so, I mean, what that means, like my colleague, Ellie Khan, who sort of covered this, sort of sat down and worked out today, that's about a £400 million shortfall in what they were expecting. Yes. And that is, yeah, that's, that's you know, it, it sounds like kind of a small amount of money to the BBC. And, and, you know, the government is arguing this is a cost of living thing. But at the same time, that is a huge, huge kind of, you know, not, I wouldn't say hole in the budget because they haven't had the money, but it's mm. kind of it is it is a drop from what they were expecting, and perhaps you know it is a real terms cut. Effectively. I mean, also we're definitely in the realm now of content being cut. We've already seen mm. it. Things like the news channels being combined, uh, Newsnight going. Mm. I mean, you've you've got to take the money off the screen, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the slight problem is that we do kind of expect the moon on a stick from the BBC, right? We we want it to be doing all these amazing things, and when it doesn't or when it gets things wrong, you know, rightly, we give it a hard time. Mm. But I think, you know, you are going to have to pay for some of that. And I think it is a really, really tricky one for the BBC to navigate. And they have kind of said in sort of a, you know, the most kind of downbeat or like sort of measured way they could. Yeah, this is going to this is going to cost us. This is going to you're going to see this on screen. There will be cuts. Well, speaking of money in the media over to Spotify now, whose love of podcasts is somewhat being tested by a sizable round of layoffs and the axing of two prestige series, Heavyweight and Stolen. Um, Adam, these were two Gimlet shows, which was part of like a kind of the deal that sort of kicked off the sort of podcasting resurgence podcasting boom us audio makers are not happy yeah they're not i mean these are prestigious shows and you know winning you know peabodies and pulitzer prizes so we're talking quite s- uh, serious kind of things i think the the gimlet purchase doesn't seem to have gone particularly well i think all things told i, I remember at the time everyone considered it like you're buying your hbo mm. you're the hbo in that but if you look at what's happened with various things to various shows over the years that that it really doesn't seem to have gone that way and what it feels like is that um from a spotify's perspective that the hosts in a studio where it's a bit more known the costs are probably fairly flat they might be really big you're paying joe rogan for example a lot of money but you kind of know where you are you know how many staff there are and of course those kind of shows just do extraordinarily well for them so it feels like you know the sort of prestigious ones and you know if we've heard the kind of credits when you hear the number of names on it and you realize the number of people because the amount of time Mm. it takes to make those kind of things feels like spotify's falling a little bit out of love with that kind of I saw someone um, describe the podcasting scene in a slightly different way, which I hadn't necessarily picked up on before, where they're sort of journalistic podcasts and then the sort of more entertainment Mm. chat casts. And as you were saying, the economics of those is staunchly different, aren't they? And the the person was basically saying that they didn't think that Spotify could understand the journalistic elements of of the business. All, All tech companies have trouble with media. Yes, I think that's fair. And again, it's that it's that kind of wanting a return on investment when actually maybe there is a good story here and you need to put the time and the effort in to find it. Maybe there isn't one. I definitely have heard some podcasts. There was a BBC one about a body they found in Norway somewhere and mm. they were trying to identify this woman who she was found in the 50s and she was probably a spy. And But 
they know nothing about her. And they kind of got to the end of the podcast and went, yeah, we still don't know anything about her. <laughs> uh, and that could have been, and, and you do with those kind of investigative podcasts, sometimes you get the amazing ones where they're like, there was a clear miscarriage of justice or we're going to change the law or there's this amazing story that emerges. And sometimes you just don't. I was thinking about this in, in relation to the Newsnight stuff as well, that that's been cut. And I always used to think, oh, well, maybe audio is going to be the next mm. space for that to happen. And it seems like, okay, maybe not. And I think it is just that thing of, it's really hard to go to somebody and go, can you pay me? to just maybe have something really good. Mm. Maybe. Well, at the beginning, CPMs were very good. The amount of money you'd get for a thousand downloads was pretty high. That's dropped back a bit. The cost of acquiring new listeners is more expensive now. Um, So suddenly the economics shift. Do you think there is a model for eight episode runs of these things? Or did they maybe get a little bit away with themselves with free cash or just a bit of too much excitement. I mean I, I, undoubtedly look they, they built up the market they spent a lot of money they spent a lot of money on big names as well and you know that, that that a lot of those haven't paid off or paid off much less and and in general terms that's probably disappearing I think there undoubtedly is I mean a lot of those those shows do hit the mark I mean investigative work always costs I think in television mm. I think in newspapers you know you might spend months doing something and then it goes nowhere and you can't use it and there's nothing to show for it and I think that that's always been the case which is why relatively few people do that really mm. well um, but the the short form I think you know certainly if you look at what BBC is doing what others are doing is it's more about putting lots of short forms into one feed mm. so that you know you put your true crime investigative pieces and you have you know have a set of eight or a set of ten and then you do another set of eight or ten and, and that means that those subscribers when they get the show whether they listen to it or not so there's adverts in there which which are counted rather than starting from zero again yeah. trying to build up a feed you, from you nothing you don't have to build you know getting people to find and discover your podcast from scratch because mm. you know undoubtedly you know however many millions of podcasts were released this week or whatever you know it, that's that's always been the hard part uh, moving on to the Premier League, uh, there's a new British TV deal with Sky and TNT Sports sharing the rights. Uh, Rebecca, it's worth 6.7 billion quid over four years, which is a 4% increase. Is it good? Is that good? Well, it, it sounds good. It looks good on paper. Um, but then actually some of my colleagues at Global Data did some sort of digging into it. And what they were saying was, well, actually, it's you're getting... Um, kind of it's a bigger number it's, mm. it's gone up from what it was but it that's also more matches for it so on a kind of per match basis actually the Premier League is not getting as good a return for what they're selling here so it's perhaps not as, as shiny a deal as it looks Adam by reading your blog there is clearly nothing you like more than <laughs> and maybe even more than Rajar of analysing a, uh, a rights deal for the Premiership yeah, it's, it is interesting. Absolutely right that they can put a positive spin, 4%, mm-hmm. as I mentioned. But the, at the same time, um, if you look at it on a per-game basis, it's gone down. I think the, there's a few interesting things here. One, it's a four-year deal, and it's got, the Premier League has traditionally done three-year deals for quite a long time now. They're, they're, they're saying that's what the broadcasters were asking for that. Another, they just realised it's peaked. I think it's difficult to say. I think you you, you run into issues. You 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 potentially much more market focused at any given point. You know, it, it feels like it comes round maybe just too frequently. If you compare and contrast with America, where they'll do ten year deals quite mm. frequently, and some of the NFL deals are running into the late twenty twenties and into the early twenty thirties, um, which I'm sure they'd love. Although then you run into things like you know the NBA at the moment, which is going to be the next big sports rights. You know, they're looking to double because it's been wow. such a long time and it's kind of the only thing on television that rates in america yeah i mean sport is just incredible for them but i think the 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 interesting thing here is there's no amazon now as part of this deal and indeed there's no new entrance you know we're back to uh sky with most of it and then tnt which of course was bt before having one package uh, a decent ish package but you know sky undoubtedly is the big winner here and even though a lot of new entrants were rumoured, you know, Dayton I think, and- yeah, they, they would definitely, and I'm, I'm sure they bid, but obviously not high enough. And, you know, the Premier League in, in the past, they, they they carved out a deal which they thought would have been good for the streamers. I, I Myself, I always found that a bit weird because Amazon, right, we're, this week as we speak, Amazon are, are broadcasting the first of their two sets of rounds of the um, Premier League and they, they burn through them all in, in December. Yes, they sort of get Christmas rights. Yeah, and then, and then it's gone and it's and they will be back. They've still got one more year of that. Um, whereas actually, I think the way Amazon has gone, they've actually got uh, one Champions League game a week from next season and 
that will obviously last, you know, a good chunk of the year, which, you know, means that you're going to come back and know to come back, whereas Amazon actually has to do quite a lot of marketing for a short period of time. Part of them would have loved an Apple or a, mm. a, a YouTube because or someone. In, in other markets, Apple, well, Apple are in Major League Baseball, aren't they? And that's in the UK too. YouTube do sports uh, in the US. Disney did... Uh, cricket in India, they're kind of out of that deal now. So the other streamers have have played about with this, haven't they? They have. I think the thing is, I think a lot of people think, oh, they've just got loads of money and that we can just get them to bid up. And I think, you know, if if you're, you know, Google or whatever, you know, we don't need to spend stupid money. Or also, you look at someone like Apple. I mean, Apple have, and they're probably their biggest deal, you know, in terms of ownership of the sport is MLS in America, mm. so the soccer in America, where they own everything. And actually, they then sub-license some of the games to other broadcasters so that you can at least discover it and occasionally see a messy game before you have to come back to Apple to see all the rest of them. It's interesting, they they tried to do a college football deal with Apple as well in America and that fell through because Apple was incredibly demanding about what it wants. So I don't think a handful of games would have been enough. Apple would have basically wanted to own the Premier League in Britain. Mm. Um, and I'm not even sure that that would have been necessarily good for the Premier League. It's one thing if you're an up and coming league like Major League Soccer is in the US, but you know, at the end of the day, they they want to be in the kind of homes that already get Sky and mm. TNT. Well, Rebecca, Netflix have talked a lot about live, haven't they? Or, mm. or they're adding a kind of pro celebrity uh, golf tournament. They sort of haven't really wanted to play in the in the sports field, otherwise, have they? No, exactly. And I was in uh, Content London last week, and Brandon Rigg, who's like one of the head honchos for Factual at, at Netflix, was sort of pointing to these exhibition matches they've been doing the golf things and sort of saying, "No, that's been really successful for us." But yeah, there wasn't. It just didn't seem to have that appetite for. Oh, let's go and do kind of yeah. The, the sort of let's go, look into the Premier league matches or the live sport in quite the same way it was more of a let's do it in these kind of controlled environments where we can sort of do our thing but we don't really need to kind of get involved with the sports leagues in the same way which i thought was quite interesting the one thing that he was saying was oh actually what we'd like is like a shiny floor sort of live talent show type thing like britain's got like with a voting element on netflix and it's kind okay of, and they're saying they've got the capacity to do that but they just haven't found sort of the right show or the right mechanics or like the right kind of you know and they sort of went kind of saying pictures your ideas which I was like I, I don't know how that would work Squid but... Game on Ice yeah maybe kind that's of. The, the way to do it um, <laughs> oh god just on, on um, sport so I've been reading so I'm not that interested in sport it's not really my thing but I have been reading those guys have all the fun inside the world of ESPN have either of you read this or seen it uh, I'm aware of it I haven't yeah read so it. it's like an oral history of ESPN and if you're interested in television and the evolution of television and also obviously sports rights it's a great story it's kind of a mad story it's a really yeah, thick okay. book but yes those guys have all the fun uh, inside the world of ESPN and we'll be back with more media news after this Now for our deep dive interview, Mike Gunton is the creative director of the BBC's Natural History Unit and responsible for Planet Earth 3, presented by David Attenborough. Based in Bristol, I spoke to him earlier today about the making of this latest series, the role the podcast plays in shaping attitudes to climate change and Attenborough's extraordinary legacy. Here's Mike. The brand, if you like, Planet Earth, has been going for 20 years. So, and the cycle has gone a bit quicker. The the gap between the first and the second was about 10 years and now it's shrunk down to about six years. So I didn't have very long to plan for this one, in fact. And funny enough, I, I don't know if, you, if, I've talk, if you've heard the story, but we were very fortunate to win a BAFTA for Planet Earth 2. And when you come off the stage grasping your little your, uh, statuette, you whisk you behind and you speak to the press. And, and I thought they were going to ask me about the series and all this. And the first question they all said, when is Planet Earth 3? So I thought, right, I better get on with it because if they're thinking that. So I literally went back to my seat in the auditorium at, at the, um, I can't remember where the event was now, but anyway, and I had all I had in my pocket was a business card and a pen. And I scribbled quickly down on the back of it. What would it be? What episodes? What and one of the things I did remember writing is it's got to be about humans. It's got to be, take a human perspective. So that kind of was the little, that was effectively the template for what we did. And actually, because Planet Earth 2 was, did make such an impact, I think the commissioners and the market said, yes, we want another one quick. So, yeah, we went straight into effectively thinking pre-production almost immediately after Planet Earth 2 went out. And here we are, what, five and a half years later, uh, it's on air. So there was a little bit of gap. Inevitably, of course, you've got to go through the process of raising the funding and actually convincing people it really is not just what's written on the back of a business card, a bit more than that. And then, of course, the the research for, for a new series, I mean, that always takes 
at least a year and probably took us a bit long probably took about 18 months to get the get all the new stories i mean how much of it is sort of pre-planned in you know the kinds the kind the sort of direction of the stories is it a bit like a constructed reality tv series or is it almost like pure reality and it's it, it's it's what's filmed uh, there's a bit of that i mean i think i've thought about this quite a lot and been asked quite a lot about what what it is it is almost a unique genre i don't think there's anything quite like whatever you i don't know what you would call a landmark natural history show the format of the of the epi- is the sort of quasi episodic nature within a, a meta episode i mean it was kind of invented by david atterborough when he did life on earth mm. you know 50 years ago and we we're only really fiddling around the edges really from that format but it is a strange combination of observed yet intense storytelling it's there's a dramatic form to it yet it's documentary uh, it, and it, it is unique it's a and it's a bit of black magic actually dark arts you know when people come and dig deep about what we do they kind of don't really understand because it it appears we just wander out into the into the wilderness with a camera switch it on an hour later switch it off and transmit it and of course it couldn't be fur- further from that uh, and I suppose when you're, you're filming material, is there a huge amount just that's, that sits on the cutting room floor? Is there is there a version A and a version B of, of Planet Earth 3 that, that could have gone out? The best version is, I hope, the one, we, of course, that we transmit. It goes back to your earlier question about what is it like a, a constructed reality? When you go on location for a particular story, you, you have an overarching theme. And in Planet Earth, it's always about, it's effectively about a habitat and the challenges that habitat imposes on the life that lives in that habitat and how different animals and plants and the rest, how they've adapted in their own unique way to overcome those. And that's sometimes contextualized by what happens in the environment itself, because the it is about planet Earth. So the Earth itself is a part of the story. But when you're going out to, tell, to film that story, you have in your mind a clear um, overarching narrative that, that, that why that animal's story is relevant to, to this bigger, bigger theme. But what actually happens on location is determined by mother nature herself and so actually rather like doing an observational documentary you know you've, you've got maybe eight characters in an obs doc and as you start filming them two or three fall by the wayside one becomes more interesting than you expected same thing happens on location you know the stories develop as you're on location and you have to be have your wits about you say well, where is this going what that actually no that's the animal that's going to be the one that's going to do the interesting thing so yes there's a lot on the cutting room floor in the sense that there will be stuff about another character, another individual, or another part of that story that you in, in, in the end decide that's not as interesting or, or just isn't time to tell. And that, I mean, to be honest, that's one of the hardest things. You, you know, if, you, if things go well, you come back with a real rich range of material. Sometimes it's quite hard to decide which is the bit of it that you want to focus on. And that partly depends on what else you've got in some of the other stories, because you're trying to create a kind of mosaic of types of story within your film. You can imagine as kind of checkerboard of, of things you need to tick off and you can't have everything, but, and that, that like a, a little bit like one of those puzzles where you move it around, eventually they all click into the right place. You go, yes, that's the picture we want to tell. And that becomes the episode. And I guess another character uh, in the piece is, is David Attenborough himself. And he's, I, th- I think he's someone that, that you, you worked with back in 87 on what was probably, I think, going to be one of his last projects, but he seems to have yes. marched on. Yes. Well, I, I started in 1987. I was still in my 20s. And he'd done Life on Earth, which was about effectively evolution. He'd done Living Planet, which is effectively about ecology. And then he wanted to do his third one of the kind of, I suppose, the pantheon or the the, the, the three sort of tenets of, of, of natural history. He wanted to do the, about animal behavior, or ethology, as he called it. And that was Trials of Life. And so I was fortunate enough to get to work on that. And I remember my first meeting in the, in the Natural History, and they, they had a, got everybody together and said, yes, we've, we're just about to embark on this series. Well, oh, by the way, we've got a new director in, Mike Gundon. Here he is. Welcome. Oh, and by the way, everybody, this is David's last series. So we need to be thinking about who's going to take over. Well, that, as I say, is, th- what is that, 34 years ago? And we've been, people have been asking and saying that ever since. And, you know, people said, well, is he going to do Planet Earth 2? And I said, well, he certainly isn't at the moment. And then, surely he's not going to do Planet Earth 3. Yes, he's going to do Planet Earth 3. I mean, I suspect I won't be doing Planet Earth 4, but it, I wouldn't want to put any money on him not doing Planet Earth 4, if and when it should happen. I mean, effectively, he is the the DNA of of Planet Earth but and the DNA of all these these big statement natural histories but i think he's become now as kind of connected with planet earth as, as he was with his own authored series which of course the ones he did in those in the 70s and 80s uh, the life ofs as, as they were called you know so no it, 
it's been brilliant working with him, of course. I mean, his his role, as you were saying there, has sort of changed over the years uh, to being kind of very sort of in the centre of it and now leading the narration. And obviously, he's usually trusted trusted by the audience. But he has a unique background because he, he was a channel controller himself. He, he was a mm-hmm. he was a program maker. Um, so what's his take on what you're all now doing sort of for him or with him? Well, he has got a remarkable sense of television. I mean, he he has you as you say he he has done virtually everything it is possible to do in television. He's run studios. He's done been a sound recordist. He's been a done dramas. He's done sport. You know, he has done television, and he and he still has a remarkable sense of audience and what makes strong television. And I and you know I have lots of conversations with him about with the direction in which we're taking things, whether he thinks it's a good idea, where where the pitfalls might be. And he, his advice is always very sage and very you know I listen to it a lot. And his his endorsement of what we're doing, I think for me is is really critical. Because it's a bit like handing your homework in or taking something home to your parents. You know, I've just done this sequence of this <laughs> what do you think? And you and you think, please. And he says you, hopefully, amazing. Never seen that before. That's remarkable. And then you think, well, if if he thinks that, and if he gives it that kind of kite mark, you're pretty sure that you're onto something that's going to be a success for the the audience. Well, he not only because he's seen everything, but also because I say he has this he has this fantastic calibration of what works for a TV audience, even at 97, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Well, if we, if we were thinking about a Planet Earth 4, um, whether that's that's <laughs> him being involved or not, what's the special source in, in, in a rater or, or kind of a participant in this way? What, what does someone need to have? <laughs> well, it's, I'm slightly going against what I said, because, of course, there can never be another David Attenborough, and, and that's a pointless opportunity. But actually, what you need is another David Attenborough. But, um, <laughs> of course, it's a mass of things. But fundamentally... It is that extraordinary integrity and intensity about knowing what it is about the natural world that is remarkable and what audiences will find remarkable and reflecting the curiosity that you have about this for the audience. Because I I often think what we're trying to do when we're successful is give the audience as close as they can an experience to what it was like for us when we were on location witnessing this. So we're acting through the camera as a kind of a transducer of what we saw uh, and putting it there. And David's job is to help that experience that we had translate into an audience. So it's as if he was there whilst we were watching it and filming it. He's recording, writing down what they saw, this was this, and then how it, and, and then he just, like a piece of poetry, speaks it out. So that somebody has to be able to have that sensitivity. You have to understand, you have to understand what's going on in animals' minds and what's going on inside their heads. Now, trying to translate what you see and how that animal is behaving so that it's, it connects with what you as a human being understand in the world. And that involves empathy, that involves intensity and perspective. A lot of it's about trying to put your yourself through the animal's eyes, both in terms of the storytelling, but also what the camera sees. And getting the camera close to animals, both physically close, but also kind of emotionally close to the animals is, is a critical part of what we do. And David is somebody who helps us explain that when he when he narrates these shows. I mean, Planet Earth, the, the kind of brands are very important to BBC Studios and, and the BBC. Um, obviously, it operates and is broadcast in lots of countries all, all, all around the world. Are you making an international show or is it a British show because other countries want to see a, a, a British execution of it? Um, how, do you th- how do you think about that as a, as a format and as a, as a program you deliver around the world? It's- I don't think you always ask me that. However, I do think about that myself because, mm. of course, part of my job, because I'm not just the executive producer of the show, I'm also the creative director of the Natural History Institute. So part of my job is to is to, to make sure that our programs are developed and, and evolved for a, an international audience. But I think fundamentally, we make a show for the license fee pair. I mean, that, that's that's in our DNA. You know, even though we work for we, I work now for BBC Studios, which is a which is you know, its job is to is to be a, a sort of global producer. We are still fundamentally making shows for the British audience. And interestingly enough, the English speaking world, there's something about the British perspective on science and nature that does seem to appeal. I, I, there may be there may be commissioners out there in some other companies who are throwing their hands up in horror and saying what, but I know from speaking to a number of people who are you know senior in in international broadcasters who say 
there's something about your way that does translate especially in the English speaker world, but I think it translates into the other parts of the world too. You know, these these projects are extraordinarily successful internationally. I, I can't remember how many countries it is, but I think there's about three countries in the world that didn't transmit it. And that's probably because they don't have any, I don't think they have a transmitter. So, you know, it, it's seen in, in pretty much every corner of the world, which is wonderful because when you go overseas, as we all do, of course, when people and you're in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and somebody says, "I saw that show in a ho- in a hotel in the centre of town or something," rather, you think, "Yeah, public service broadcasting reaches wide." It does, and uh, also it reaches wide wide from Bristol, which has been a, a core base of the National yeah. History Unit. And I think you're in you're in New Digs with Ardman uh, over the road as well. Um, yes, we the Natural History Unit's been in Bristol for sixty six years, I think it is, um, and it's a bit of a quirk of BBC broadcasting history. I mean, most of network programming was always made in London historically. But for some weird reason, the clever people in Bristol managed to steal something or other and, and set up camp down in Bristol, which has been a one... Again, I should be careful what I say, but I think it's been wonderful for us because we kind of get left alone. So always we, you know, we're this, we're seen as a slightly eccentric bunch, which we are to some degree. <laughs> um, we're left to our own devices. As long as we keep making these programmes, we kind of get, get, get left alone. So Bristol became a kind of a an epicenter for wildlife filmmaking. And Oh, of course, there are now many other people who make make these kind of shows mm. who aren't the BBC. There's independence of all of all color, color and stripe, but they t- a lot of them are in a kind of hinterland around, or they're connected anyway to to, to around Bristol. And I think there's there's a kind of a centre of gravity here, which brings in production houses and camera talent and sound talent, all that kind of thing, aggregates around Bristol. And we we the NHU were for many, many, you know, all, mostly all of our lives up in White Ladies Road. But then three years ago, we, we moved down to this fancy new premises down in the docks. And it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a kind of an uber eco, low, you know, low energy environment. And it's... Well, yeah, that's what you want for the National History Unit. Yeah, yeah, we should be doing, we should be doing that. Funnily enough, I, I, I was in those offices for, I say, for 30, 30 odd years. And I thought I would be, they'd had to drag me out. The opposite. I couldn't. I never thought about it again. The new premises. It's something about the infrastructure there is is just it's 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 more all open plan. And again, a lot of us thought, oh, really, do we want to be open plan? But actually, it creates a real creative oomph, real uh, creative hive. Well, that's that's great. I mean, this week we've had, uh, as we kind of continually have, uh, there's obviously questions about the BBC license fee and uh, it being connected to. Uh, below level inflation and the the knock on that that will uh, have on on the corporation and there is a kind of interesting relationship going forward isn't there with BBC Studios and what it does to bring money into the corporation alongside the public service side mm. um, but it's hard to divide the two sometimes uh, and any cuts aren't great for for program makers are they or for the public that want to consume not inexpensive programs like the the one that you've just made well we are. Even though, we're, as I say, I now work for BBC Studios, we're very, very tightly bound, in, in, in sort of historically, but also in terms of our values and our ambitions with public public service. Of course, we're still part of the mothership. You mm. know, it's still we're still part of BB, the BBC. So in, any any headwinds that the BBC faces, inevitably, we will feel them, and we will we have to deal d- deal with them. And one of the things that's been always been quite interesting about working in the Natural History Unit, we've always been for want of a better word, commercial, in the sense that our programmes have always travelled very well internationally, partly, of course, because animals don't speak French, German, <laughs> Serbo, Croat, whatever. And also the sorts of stories we tell are, are kind of culturally agnostic. You know, everybody understands what animals, these are pretty much what these animals do. So I think we, we, we've always had the pressure on us and the ability to fund and bring in resources to make the, make these programs from the international market. Um, of course, the public service are an important part of that, that funding, and ultimately they are a commissioner for the, something like Planet Earth 3. We, we do have, we, we do have the, the skills and the experience to, to make sure that these programs are adequately funded in the future. And obviously it's not just the show, is it? There's obviously spin-off elements that are used in different places where maybe ad breaks are, but also there's a podcast that accompanies this series uh, as well yes. from the, the Radio 4 team. Um, it's great that it can exist in those places too. Yeah. We, in fact, there's, it's sitting around me, there's a number of us who have been working on it. We just did, did the last recording of the last episode this morning, actually. And it's it's really been an interesting thing to do, editorially interesting uh, and, and creatively interesting. But what I found enjoyable about it, and 
is, is that it's an opportunity to genuinely go behind the scenes because th- there's a there's a sort of freedom to be unre- unrestrained or to to amble around what we do and the funny thing is that you know of course we live this every single day of our lives and so to us it feels like kind of well of course we do this but actually when you get a good interviewer starting to talk to you about this you and that you realize actually you know, this is probably people probably find this quite fascinating it's a kind of vicarious experience of of understanding what it is what we do and also we are we are human beings. We these these the experience of doing these films is is complex. You know, the it's it can be quite challenging at times. It can be wonderfully uplifting, but especially as time goes on, more recent times, as we started to see some of the places we love and have been to from over the years, perhaps not doing as well as they were. Some of the species that we filmed at the beginning of Zorico not doing so well. Others that were in trouble doing better. You know, and it gives us an opportunity to to just expand i suppose is what i'm trying to say on some of these things that we think about and we talk about amongst ourselves but perhaps would only talk amongst ourselves and think, talk about it amongst ourselves so um yes it gives an opportunity it's it's a, a vehicle for us to share what we do and how we feel and how we think about what we about what we do to a broad audience and it seems to be people seem to be liking it so well, we can do well some more. normally i say that the pictures are better on the radio but i think in this case i'm not entirely sure that's that that's the case uh so this obviously sort of comes to an end towards the end of this year into next year what what does 2024 have in store for the units what are you what are you working on next well i'm i'm pleased to say there's a we've got a lot of work in the pipeline it's always nerve-wracking when you look forward what you know what's what's the landscape of television it changes so fast and it continues to change faster as well but there does seem to be an appetite for the very best type of programming of this type um and i think there has been quite a lot of it about for over the last few years and I, I, perhaps some of that is going to fall by the wayside but there does seem to be for the very best and for the for, and the very and for the very particular thing pro- programs and projects that have something genuinely interesting and new to say about the natural world there is a real appetite for that and there are a number of projects that we we have to do the only reason why i'm slightly dodging the question is i can't remember what what programs <laughs> i'm allowed to talk about that's but fine we will, we will let we will let you off um but, uh, but that- i i'm personally but i've got I'm, i've got a, at least four projects uh, big projects that i'm going to be working on in the future and actually there's one with sir david coming out right at the end of the year uh, a, a little passion project of his um which i think you'll all enjoy one of his great loves is is fossils and it's a fantastic story about a great fossil a british fossil found found on the on the south coast of britain uh, well we look forward to seeing that uh, mike thanks for joining us that was mike gunton uh, right adam and rebecca are back for the media quiz this week entitled pressed for time i have three fleet street stories to share with you the problem is i only have two seconds to tell them so can you unpick my speedy praises and explain the story at length i love the way they make me do all the hard work (laughs) Uh, it's best of three so buzz in with your names if you know the answer Uh, so rebecca you will say rebecca and adam you will say adam let's play pressed for time number one dyson loses libel Rebecca. Yes. Uh, so this was uh, essentially a uh, comment piece in the mirror mm. where they had uh, effectively kind of criticised quite, I don't think actually as robustly, you know, I, I'm quite surprised it went as far as trial, but uh, essentially Dyson for backing Brexit and then moving his headquarters to Singapore. And they'd sort of said that he'd kind of screwed the country and sort of done a runner. And um, yeah, Dyson sued and lost. I mean, um, the, the line is... The vacuum cleaner tycoon... I'm hoping that I'm, he, he won't come after us there. The vacuum cleaner tycoon who championed vote leave due to the economic opportunities it would bring to British industry before moving his global head office to Singapore. I mean, there's not a lot there, is there? No, and it's... Yeah, and I think that he did say... It did say screwed the country or something mm. as well, and they kind of decided that was an opinion. I'm shocked that that got as far as, as, as court, to be honest, because it just seems such an obvious, like, open and shut, honest opinion case. I mean, it plays into sort of all the issues around slaps, doesn't mm. it? And this is sort of very rich people wanting to curb some journalism yeah and i mean i've definitely been in positions where i've had a story and essentially we've been told look you've probably got all the evidence you should be fine we can't afford to defend this in court if they sue we're not running it um which is 
utterly depressing when it happens. And yeah, it does feel like it is a little bit about sort of, um, well, I don't want to say <laughs> about a particularly uh, litigious person, but it does, it does, you know, one might think perhaps that it, it feels a little bit like, yeah, um, making an example of somebody or hoping mm. they'll just back down and settle and retract it, which they, you know, fair place and the mirror didn't. And yes. they took it to court. And it is expensive to defend these things, even if you win. Um, so fair play. And it does have that chilling effect, doesn't it? I mean, yes. If you, if you are worried about these sorts of things, then you don't print slightly dangerous stuff yeah well, exactly like it's, like I say, it's happened to me uh, right question number two remember I might piece of paper please oh that, Adam <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> I mean, I think I heard the word Barclays in yes. there. Oh, so. I didn't even hear the words. <laughs> yeah, is your next job racing commentary? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, clearly not. Clearly yeah, not. so this this will be the sale of the Telegraph and the Spectator, which has kind of gone through, but is now a subject to a, a public intervention mm. notice. I forget the exact term, but um, yeah. So obviously, this um, group backed with Abu Dhabi money, has paid off the uh, debts that uh, the Barclays had at Lloyd's, which then allows the Barclays to take ownership. (laughs) But obviously the idea then is that this group then takes over from the Barclays the the control of the two papers. And uh, that's where a cultural secretary has stepped in and is a sort of Let's have a long, hard look at this and see if we want Abu Dhabi owning the Telegraph. I mean, it's the kind of thing that if it sort of goes wrong for Redbird, it's kind of back with the Barclays who now have the papers that probably aren't worth 1.3 billion and they owe uh, Redbird slash the Abu Dhabi lot all the money. Yeah, it's it's really hard to get your head around that and whole then you thing. Oh, he gets the Telegraph after all of that as well. Yeah, I know. It's, I, look, I, I mean, and, and the trouble is that there's been a lot of talk in the media, but everyone is an interested party one way or the other, <laughs> you know. So the other groups, be that you know Murdoch or the Mail Group, or um, I saw even Axel Spring, yes. you know, was looking, you know, lots of people who would have quite liked it. And it's kind of interesting because the way it was done is that they just went in over the top mm. and you could, you know, this slightly smart deal, we'll just pay off your debts and it doesn't go there, which might have been more than it went for at auction, but might not have been. Also, but you, you get it. it. You get it. it. Yeah. So, you know, do I do that? Anyway, it's buy it now on eBay, right? Well, they were hoping to scare off other bidders as well, weren't they? Because they're so invested in having this company, which, yeah, like, it's probably not worth what they're paying for. But it. also, like we talked about on, on the podcast last week, everyone's had a bit of a kick in of um, Jeff Zucker. Uh, but as soon as you become a baron, then you, you're clear, aren't you? Yeah. They, all, they all sort of look after themselves. So we'll see who yeah. gets to be the new boss later on. Right. Um, I think that's uh, a point apiece. A uh, final one. New European and Profit. Adam, was Adam. that was that the new European is in profit? Correct. Yes, that's right. The new European is in profit with thirty three thousand paying readers. Uh, we had Matt Kelly on the show a few weeks ago, and he was saying it was on the cards. I mean, no mean feat uh, to to be successful in the newspaper industry and still from a relatively recent time. Yeah, I mean, to start a new publication and 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 make because we did have, I've forgotten the name of it. There was a a, a magazine, that, a newspaper that the Mirror tried to start a few years ago, wasn't there? And mm. he, everyone was quite hopeful, and it just just it tried, it tried, mm. and it just didn't get anywhere. So yeah, the fact that this is making profit, which some of the really established titles are not doing at the moment, is brilliant. Is yeah, I and mean, we does show you need a particular tone of voice, or you need a certain niche, don't you, to to do well in the media yeah i mean they carved it out they went into the sort of you know obviously the the post-brexit kind of thing and they they found that area and 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 they're super serving it Mm. and maybe that's not an area easily filled you know broadcast uh, there's not not really a space in broadcasting and across the wider existing landscape yeah but it is it's interesting you know that a print product like that can can still do it it's great uh, well uh, adam uh, you become our winner you get to uh, take the media podcast to launch a new spin-off newspaper title and to turn it into profit as well so if you can sort that out that'd Brilliant. be great uh, my <laughs> thanks to you adam uh, and to you rebecca uh, rebecca where can people keep up with your work you can find me on broadcastnow.co.uk and on uh, Twitter or X at, at Rebecca K. Cooney. Uh, Adam? AdamBowie.com or at AdamBowie on threads.
these days. Lovely. Uh, thank you both. And that's it from us today at the London Podcast Studios. Remember, you can get 25% off your first booking at this lovely place when you use the code MEDIAPOD. That's at thelondonpodcaststudios.com. That's MEDIAPOD at thelondonpodcaststudios.com for 25% off. And if you're new to the show, why not hit follow and get us in your ears all year round? And whilst you're there, why not share the show with your friends and tell them that they too should listen to all this media goodness every week? Uh, my name is Matt Deegan. The producers were Ollie. Pitt and Matt Hill. It was a Rethink Audio production. I'll see you next week.